Hey everyone, I'm Diana Davison, advocate for the falsely accused and wrongfully convicted. Now, victims of false allegations, especially in high-profile cases, rarely have proper remedy. Even if you clear your name in a court of law, reputations are never fully restored. Civil suits are more expensive than criminal trials, and in most cases, the defendant in the suit would be unlikely to pay, even if you win. And yet, the public perception is that if you don't sue afterwards, that the allegations must have been at least partially true. On April 23rd, a statement of claim in a defamation suit was filed against Bell Media, CTV, Wendy Freeman, Lisa LaFlemme, Glenn McGregor, Rachel Aiello, CP24, Travis Danraj, and up to four other people who may become known in the course of the lawsuit. This is a libel suit resulting from the reckless publication of false sexual assault allegations against Patrick Brown, former leader of the Progressive Conservative Party, which resulted in Brown's forced resignation overnight. The scandalous story not only destroyed Brown's reputation, personal well-being, and political future, it interfered with the upcoming provincial election, which Brown was predicted to win. An interesting point in the suit is that whether or not you believed Patrick Brown was going to win, CTV had previously published that they predicted him to win, and what they thought is quite important in terms of their liability and knowledge of the damage being done. I was happy to see a section in the suit mentioning that the defamation interfered with the Democratic election. It's not just Patrick Brown who was damaged by these false allegations. The Canadian public was denied a fair election as well. Of course, the public are getting used to smear campaigns in politics, increasingly being asked to vote for the lesser of evils instead of voting for someone who's actually good at the job. And we've become far too complacent. Brown's defamation suit was reported as seeking $8 million in damages, but the total amount may be millions more. The special damages sought are at the discretion of the judge and could result in over $10 million. Some people are disappointed that the women who made the false accusations aren't named as defendants, but I see good reason for that. One, people go around saying all kinds of things that the press shouldn't publish. It's the job of journalists to make sure that they don't publish or republish lies or gossip. Two, Glenn McGregor made it clear that CTV sought out these accusers and coerced them into making their accusations public. Three, suing the women would be seen as abusive. Patrick Brown has never abused women and isn't about to start. The details of how vicious CTV's behavior was are outlined step by step in the lawsuit, but I like how it's summarized in the final paragraph. The malicious, high-handed, callous, oppressive, and arrogant conduct of the defendants warrants an unprecedented award of punitive, aggravated, and exemplary damages to reflect the exceptional harm done to Mr. Brown and to ensure that the defendants are appropriately punished for their conduct and that they and others are deterred from such conduct in the future. And their arrogance was quite stunning indeed. CTV and their employees' behavior failed to even minimally meet the current generous standards for responsible reporting. Though the claims in the lawsuit are not yet proven in court, the evidence for each outlined behavior is publicly available. As a brief note, in Canada, the primary precedent in defamation law is set by a case called Grant v. Torstar, This case created a new defense against libel called responsible communication, which allows for a statement to be false as long as the person or news outlet publishing the statement made reasonable efforts to verify the facts and obtain both sides of the story. Patrick Brown's case against CTV and their employees, if successful, is not only important because it would be the highest award for libel in Canadian history, but also because of the increasing recklessness with which allegations are being broadcast. I hope this lawsuit brings some sanity back to the conversation and hammers home the gravity of the damage being done to innocent people's lives. I hope Patrick Brown receives more than $10 million, and I hope the media denounce the actions of CTV. Most people knew that Patrick Brown was only given five hours to respond when Glenn McGregor from CTV sent the allegations to Brown's chief of staff. The extent of what's called the ambush email is outlined in paragraphs 54 through 58. The email did not contain the name of the first accuser and incorrectly stated that she was an underage high school student, 
so it would have been impossible for Brown to identify who they were talking about in order to make a meaningful reply. When people are asked for a response to anonymous allegations, it's a trap. If you guess the correct person, it would seem to confirm her story. If you guess an incorrect person, it gives the journalist a new name to call on the basis that you think that person might be willing to trash talk about you. While anonymity is offered to protect an accuser from public scorn or ridicule, it simply cannot be extended to hide the identity from the accused when being asked for a response. It's dishonest entrapment, posing as a fair request for comment. Now, one of the defenses for not doing careful fact-checking is if the matter is urgent or if the event is unfolding rapidly in real time. But that's not the case here. CTV and CP24, both owned by Bell Media, broadcast the allegations as breaking news and exclusive reports, but they'd been poking around for months trying to build a story. The election was in June, over four months away, and the allegations were from many years earlier. No one else was preparing to beat them to the press. The only urgent element was created by CTV's choice, their choice to publish by 10 p.m. the same day. They created the urgency themselves. In fact, one of the accusers was completely flummoxed as to how she even ended up talking to them. Do you remember exactly when it happened, like the month or the year? No. I, I didn't even... Like, because my girlfriend knows Travis, or somebody knows Travis, so I guess, I don't know how he found out about it, but she said that I should talk to him. The person asking the questions there was Lisa Laflamme, CTV news anchor, about whom the lawsuit states in paragraph 13, The January 24th broadcast, defined herein, was edited in a manner that conceals Laflamme's role in any on-tape or other interviews with Accuser 1 and Accuser 2, in an attempt to, among other things, lead viewers to believe that Laflamme was more independent in relation to her reporting on Mr. Brown than in fact she was. The next paragraph, they point out that Glenn McGregor, who's in deeper doo-doo, knowingly misled the public in more than one way. The January 24th broadcast was edited in a manner that suggests that only McGregor conducted on-tape interviews of Accuser 1 and Accuser 2. And additionally, in paragraphs 39 and 40, they point out, McGregor quoting Brown. It was she who tried to kiss me while the woman I was seeing was in another room, Brown said. I stopped immediately and offered to drive her home, which I did. McGregor intentionally misquoted Mr. Brown in the February 13th, 2018 broadcast, omitting the word her when quoting Mr. Brown's Facebook statement, which reads, I stopped her immediately. It really is a devastating breakdown of how deceptive and negligent CTV was from start to finish. And again, the case is not proven in court, it's just that the publicly available evidence supports all the allegations. Paragraph 70 lists all the ways CTV acted recklessly. From the flippant way they announced the first accuser wasn't actually underage, the most damaging aspect to the entire original story to their admission that they didn't even call the mutual friend to fact-check until 20 days after publication, to then only saying the friend didn't recall the incident when in fact he denied ever knowing that Patrick and the woman had even met, to leaving out witness statements completely when it undermined the story. The list goes on. The entire lawsuit is uploaded on Scribed, and I'll put a link below. The facts of the case are laid out in the claim, and the meat of the case is easily verifiable, though spread out on various news reports. The lawsuit puts it all in one readable place. If Patrick Brown doesn't win this case, then there's no meaningful protection in Canada against defamation. That CTV won't acknowledge their failure to meet generous standards may imply to the court that Grant v. Torstar isn't strongly worded enough. CTV's abuse of the very generous protections for the press could be catastrophic for freedom of the press in the future. What has happened to us? With rights come responsibilities. News outlets need to remember that earning trust from the public takes a long time, but it can be lost much faster. And earning trust back is much more difficult. One thing we do know, because history is recorded, we know what happens to a society when the media becomes nothing more than a propaganda machine spreading popular lies. 
There's a reason people don't believe what they read in the news anymore, and it's up to journalists now to win that trust back.